Good afternoon, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, noon uh, session entitled Advances in Mitral Repair Therapies with the specific emphasis on the Pascal Repair uh, System. I have the pleasure to co-chair this uh, symposium with uh, Jörg Hausleiter from uh, Munich. And I also like uh, to welcome our uh, panelists, uh, Kostas uh, Spargas uh, from Athens in uh, Greece, Stefan von Badeleben also uh, from, uh, from Germany, uh, Becky Hahn uh, from uh, New York, uh, Philipp Lurz from uh, Leipzig, and Volker Rudolf uh, from uh, Germany. Just uh, to set the stage, uh, please allow me to make some uh, general remarks. I think you are all aware that uh, mitral regurgitation is a uh, frequent disease manifestation affects approximately 10% of uh, the elderly, that is uh, uh, people that are 75 years or older, and as such is the most uh, frequent uh, valvular heart uh, disease that we encounter. Now, just in terms of the natural history, uh, it suffices to say that both primary MR and secondary MR as compared to uh, uh, individuals that do not have mitral regurgitation are associated with impaired uh, prognosis. And therefore, the important question is as to uh, medical interventions that aim at improving uh, prognosis. Now, the first one is there is no dedicated medical therapy. You see here the impact of uh, optimal medical therapy in patients with primary MR, and you see that event rates uh, during long-term uh, follow-up remain increased as it relates to heart failure hospitalization, atrial fibrillation, or the need for subsequent uh, intervention. Similarly, if you look at secondary MR, you clearly see that as compared to individuals that have no or only mild, uh, mild secondary mitral uh, regurgitation, the event rates are much higher in those with moderate and severe MR despite so-called optimal uh, medical uh, therapy. Finally, the impact of uh, surgery you see here on the left side for primary MR on the right side for secondary MR. And it is, needs to be acknowledged that, that for primary MR, surgery has excellent uh, results. That is, in patients that have a successful surgical repair, actually there is a restoration of prognosis as compared to an age and match, uh, sex matched uh, population. Conversely, in secondary MR, there is no evidence uh, that surgical intervention is of uh, use in these patients. Now, why do we talk about minimal invasive uh, transcatheter-based uh, therapies? The main reason is that for multiple registries, uh, there is evidence that the proportion of patients with severe MR that are not treated uh, by uh, any kind of intervention is rather large. And the reasons for this are typically advanced age, multiple comorbidities, and decreased left ventricular ejection fraction, uh, which may increase the risk, uh, for example, for uh, surgery. And in that context, it's important to consider transcatheter uh, therapies. However, the uh, progress has not been as rapid as uh, in the uh, aortic valve uh, area or space, largely due to the complex anatomy. First, uh, there is a complex uh, topographic anatomy uh, with associated structures, namely the atrioventricular conduction system, coronary arteries like the circumflex and also the coronary uh, sinus. Then frequently more than one component of uh, the mitral valve is affected, not just just the leaflets, and finally, the mitral annulus is a very complex, non-circular, three-dimensional uh, structure. Now, the focus of uh, today's uh, symposium is to address uh, the progress uh, that has been made with introduction of a new specific uh, device, uh, that is the Edwards Pascal Transcatheter Valve Repair uh, System that has been specifically designed to optimize uh, the uh, leaflet uh, capture and the associated results. And in the subsequent uh, 90 minutes, uh, we have the opportunity to discuss this both from a data point of view and uh, from specific cases in a more uh, detail. Thank you very much. Yes, Stefan, thank you very much for this kind introduction. And it's now our pleasure to listen to Dr. Spargas from um, Greece. And he will tell us about the latest innovations in uh, mitral valve therapies. Please. Good afternoon to everybody. It's my pleasure and privilege to be here with you today. 
Uh, and I'd like to introduce you to the Pascal uh, device and the latest updates uh, on their clinical um, trials. So this is um, the uh, Pascal implant, um, and uh, you can get a glimpse of the device here. You see it consists of a spacer, the paddles, and the uh, clasps that are hidden within. So it aims to approximate the leaflets by positioning the leaflets, uh, capturing them and positioning them between the paddles and the spacer. So that's why some refer to this leaflet uh, repair technology as uh, a leaflet to spacer. Uh, so this central spacer aims to fill in the regurgitant orifice area uh, and be between the leaflets. And the spacer and the puzzles are broad, and uh, this design reduces stress on the leaflets. And finally, the clasps have this uh, uh, very distinct uh, uh, feature of independent grasping, and um, that certainly it's helpful in certain cases that we have difficulty to simultaneously grasp the um, leaflets and also optimizes the result. This is the delivery system. The delivery system consists of 22 hydrophilic um, guide seats uh, and the steerable catheter. These two catheters are steerable, and so they allow us, by using the, this steerability, to reach any area in a three-dimensional um, uh, space and also to approach the, mit the mitral valve and the point we want to leave our device uh, with the correct trajectory. And finally, the implant catheter. So this combination of three independently moving catheters, they provide a seamless maneuvering uh, of uh, the device into the left atrium and towards the mitral valve. Um, and um, so this, uh, it's very helpful for predictable positioning. So this is a typical or a standard result you would expect from Pascal. You see a patient with severe FMR and a very wide um, um, uh, VC, and uh, you'll probably expect to see more than one device to take uh, out that mitral regurgitation, but you see the result we achieved with uh, just one device, uh, in, um, it's very um, noticeable and um, satisfactory. And the key advantages of um, the Pascal system is the optimized leaflet capture, which is uh, provided by the independent leaflet capture feature that it has, and also from the seamless maneuvering of the three independent capsules into the left atrium, and effective uh, MR reduction by the broad uh, central spacer and the paddles, and um, um, we believe uh, that uh, it provides excellent safety profile uh, because of the spring-like, not a vice grip mechanism, but a spring-like closing mechanism of the paddles and the leaflets, and also by the fact that uh, when we need to re uh, revert the device and come back into the uh, left atrium for whatever reason, we can straighten the, the whole device into a straight line, a straight road, and this improves the um, um, safety when we move into to uh, the subvalvular uh, space. So going to the latest update of the, of the CLASP study, the CLASP study is the first landmark study of this device. Uh, it is a single arm, multi-center, prospective study to evaluate safety. And pretty standard criteria for this type of leaflet technology, transcatheter technology, inclusion and exclusion criteria. So patients that were symptomatic were included uh, despite optimal uh, therapy. Um, the cardinacy for transcatheter mitral valve repair um, was uh, determined and approved by the heart teams, and uh, patients had to have severe um, significant regurgitation confirmed by transphysial echocardiography, and the primary uh, um, area should be central, and um, if there was a secondary one outside of the center, it had to be non-significant. An exclusion criteria, uh, size, sizing criteria, so we wanted to have a um, satisfactory mitral valve area both four square uh, centimeters, um, uh, ejection fraction of uh, no less than 20 percent, and uh, no evidence of mass thrombus or vegetation uh, into the heart. And um, also, we didn't want to have significant, uh, clinical, uh, clinically significant right-sided heart failure um, uh, or evidence of severe right ventricular uh, dysfunction and also a life expectancy uh, of uh, at least one year 
uh, was required. Primary endpoint were safety endpoint, endpoints and the composite of MAEs at 30 days with uh, all the specific components that are included here, cardiovascular mortality, stroke, MI, you need for replacement therapy, severe bleeding, and re-intervention for study device related complications. Performance um, measure, um, measurements like device success, procedural success, and clinical success, and secondary endpoints uh, predefined at 30 days, six months, and one year, and we're gonna discuss about the six months um, today. So this, uh, the study took place uh, across three uh, continents, 14 sites um, um, around the study, uh, most of them, as you can see, in North America, and 62 patients were included um, in the study. After one death and one withdrawal from the study, uh, 60 patients were available for the 30-day follow-up, and after further one death and two uh, uh, exits from the study, 57 patients were available for the six-month follow-up. So the study demo, uh, demographics also pretty standard for this type of population we, we treat with transcatheter mitral repair. The patients were elderly, uh, but not uh, in the octogenarian range, mostly males, uh, all of them symptomatic and most of them severe um, symptoms. And also the, the mixture of uh, etiology was pretty standard what we see in today's studies in this field. Most of them, the majority were functional regurgitation, but also a substanti substantial proportion of degenerative and a small of mixed etiology, and of course, MR severity uh, was three or above in all patients. Procedural characteristics. So the, the, the implant rate, the success implant rate was 95%, all but three patients. One was S um, SLDA and the other two, um, the device could not be implanted. The mean uh, number of devices per patient was 1.5, and the procedure time was a little more than two hours, skin to skin. And this is the uh, safety profile, the primary endpoints at 30 days. Um, in um, the CLASP study, so cardiovascular mortality was just one patient, one patient, 1.6 percent. That was a bleeding complication, access site-related bleeding complication, zero strokes, MIs, or need for new renal replacement therapy. Severe bleeding was noted in four patients, but half of these bleeds were severe GI bleeds, and the other two access-related bleeds. Reintervention for star device-related complication was just one case, and um, the, the the SLDA case that had to be converted to surgery. So the composite of MAEs was um, um, pretty low at 66.5% uh, as you can see. Now what was really um, um, remarkable and um, very exciting in this study were the MR reduction results. Um, MR reduction results that um, um, I think I haven't seen in any of other um, leaflet uh, repair technologies so far. Uh, so 98% of 30 days, um, the MR was reduced to grade two or below. And what is more important is that 86% of uh, the patients had grade zero or one. And this result was sustained uh, almost exactly the same as you can see at six months um, with uh, um, almost the same numbers. And so this, this is very important finding uh, from this study so far. And of course, this uh, MR reduction results were coupled very nicely with uh, clinical improvement Improvements, as noted in um, the functional class of the patients, you see that most of them uh, went to class one and two, and this result was sustained to six months. There were no uh, further changes in the functional status, and the same for the six-minute walk test. We had an improvement of almost 40 meters, and um, similarly, we had um, uh, improvements in the quality of life uh, scoring system, as you can see here, at 30 days, and these improvements were the same sustained. Uh, at six months with both the cancer uh, questionnaire and the Euro quality uh, questionnaire. So 
this uh, first results from uh, the Pascal transcatheter repair system, but I think it's a very, uh, very nice uh, showing that it's a very safe procedure with this device and also very effective. Um, and um, it's very remarkable that these results were achieved by operators that had little or zero experience with this device as it's a new device in the past. And despite, um, and despite that, uh, this uh, very beautiful result were um, uh, achieved. At six months, the reduction of MR uh, was very significant and sustained with 98% uh, of patients having MR2 or below and 81% of patients having MR1 or below. And all these improvements we noticed at 60 days that the functional status, the exercise capacity and the quality of life were sustained to six months. And of course, this is the first a um, big landmark study of this device, but um, uh, the follow-up is continued and um, uh, additional studies certainly uh, are needed to validate this initial and very promising results. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spargas, uh, for this very nice um, presentation and these great results for the uh, Pascal system. We have the possibilities to take also questions, so please come to the microphones, identify yourself, so that we can discuss those results. Perhaps I'm going to start with one question. Um, can you tell us, perhaps also, also the audience again, about the size of the device, and if you place 1.5 of these devices in the mitral valve, how does this impact the mitral valve gradient at the end? I, I don't have on hand the, the exact gradients of the study, but I know that uh, they were below four millimeters of mercury, uh, the, the average. And um, um, the, the device uh, dimensions, as you know, the width is 10 millimeters, and the span when you uh, open the puddles is close to 25 millimeters. I'm not sure about the exact number. It also depends how much you uh, open it, but it can reach to that number. Uh, and um, um, about the, 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 the fears of that, um, um, because it's wider, it may cause um, higher gradients. I think that this didn't materialize in the study because the, the mechanism, the closing uh, mechanism of this device is different, as, a, as I've explained, is a spring-like mechanism which allows for some um, um, movement and some preservation of the anatomical geometry at that area of the leaflets at the tips. So uh, uh, my feeling is that the, the, um, the gradient um, uh, problem, is, it's, there's no gradient problem with this device despite uh, the width. Also, um, you, because of, of these characteristics, you can have a um, good result with one device, so the need uh, to go for a second or a third device is lower. Um, Costas, uh, regarding the study, you included both uh, primary and secondary uh, MR. Were there any differences in terms of uh, the outcome, uh, let's say number of clips to be implanted or residual uh, mitral regurgitation that you can share with us? Um, again, I don't have the exact numbers, but I, I remember from the paper that they submitted that there were no uh, great differences between the two groups. Um, and. Um, Two devices were implanted in almost half of the patients. The average number per patient was 1.5 um, without uh, any problems in the gradients, as I said earlier. You mentioned in this early phase, obviously, we are looking at uh, safety and overall we are used uh, to a very high uh, safety uh, standard. Uh, but you mentioned the bleeding uh, and um, you said that apparently out of six there were four uh, gastrointestinal bleedings. Can you tell us a little bit more about those? Were they related to, to the uh, transesophageal echo? Were these uh, spontaneous bleeds? Uh, what kind of bleeding were they? Um, I don't have the exact um, uh, details of these bleeds, but there were GI bleeds. This is the, the only thing I can tell. Half of them were GI bleeds and the other half were exercise related, which I think emphasizes the importance of the um, very detailed 
uh, care, aftercare, all these patients should have. So it's not only the procedure, but uh, it's also the after-procedure care that we should be very focused on these patients because otherwise we are in danger to lose a patient from minor trivial complications if we don't care of them. Are there any other questions? Comments? Oh, any comments from the panel? Stefan? I think uh, you know, the GI bleed is also always, a, a, you know, as, a, as an imager, we always are worried that it's our fault. Um, but I do think that with advanced um, three-dimensional imaging, we do a lot less movement of the catheter, of the, of the TE probe. And so uh, the hope is that as we get more and more advanced three-dimensional imaging, that actually the probe can remain relatively still. Uh, for instance, we used to, um, in evaluating some of these uh, devices, have to routinely go into a transgastric view, which we don't normally have to do uh, anymore to place these devices. So um, again, hopefully, uh, with advanced imaging, uh, the GI bleeding from TEE manipulation will be less. Perhaps we should also highlight that the sheaf size gets down further and further. We're looking here at 22 French, so we're only crossing the septum now with seven millimeters. And actually, we don't experience any, any side excess problems here. It's a venous procedure, so we're on the low pressure field. So I think it's also a very, very safe procedure with low mortality and low complication rates, as seen in the CLASP study. Philip? Maybe coming back to the, to the to the issue of the gradient, I think it's very important to to underline that one should not be misled by the mere size of the device. Predicting the gradient is very difficult. It includes the the efficacy of the procedure. Obviously, when you reduce MR to um, when you abolish it in total, then you will have a lower gradient as compared to when you have more residual MR. It includes the mitral valve opening, but also the annular compliance. I believe something we do not measure in routine. And at least in our experience, um, we don't have a gradient increase you might expect just by looking at the size of it. And this is from our early experience probably because you remain annular compliance. The device is quite compliant. The way the leaflets are captured in the device um, also remains some leaflet compliance. And this is probably why we do not see a gradient increase, which is a problem. I also think we have a difference in the closing and the opening mechanism. We have to say that the clasp mechanism, which actually attaches the leaflets to the spacer and not to each other, actually is different. And the pedals only help actually in systole to further close the valve, but they allow in opening actually that there is side flow uh, to the spacer. So I think this is a unique mechanism that is also different to uh, other devices we have known so far. I know that you're all four very, very active in that field and have a lot of experience. We have a question from the audience, which is, uh, what is the gradient really in those cases who are treated with two devices? Do you have some feedback from your experience? Um, from my experience, I had, uh, if I remember correctly, six or seven cases with two devices. We never had a problem with the gradient in both FMR and DMR, so we never had to remove a device because of an elevated gradient. Do you want to also comment on that, Volkov, so, perhaps? So we had two cases with uh, like critical reduction of residual orifice area after the first device and uh, um, no problem after placing a second device. One of these cases I will actually show later, so it's an excellent question. I, th I think uh, it also depends on the baseline uh, orifice area that you're starting with. So often we'll make a decision as to whether or not it's safe to proceed with, uh, with two clips or, 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 or you know, uh, pre-procedurally plan two clips if the valve area is very large and the orifice area is large. Um, but the other thing about the, the device itself um, is that the paddles are not solid. I, I have you, yeah, so they're actually soft on the edge, which is the other reason um, I believe also you're not completely closing off the edges, as Stefana said. Um, they're actually, it, they're very soft, and so um, it does allow the, the leaflets to, uh, to, to open. Uh, thank you again, uh, Costas. I think that gave us a first insight uh, from the data point of view, but now we are uh, yep. looking more how the procedure actually will work. And uh, yeah. Stefan von uh, Badelim will show us a recorded uh, case uh, from his institution, and I'm sure that will uh, generate additional insight and uh, discussion. 
Stefan Jörg, thank you very much uh, for having me here to share with you the ex early experience, of course, uh, with the Pascal repair system. And I'm very honored to show you uh, among the first uh, 15 cases at our institution, uh, a recorded case from the Mainz University Hospital Heart Valve Center. Uh, these are my disclosures. So we'll now go immediately into the case and uh, what we'll present to you is um, a case of a 71-year-old patient from our center. A 70-year-old male patient with a normal height of 178 centimeters. He is New York Heart Association Class 3. The etiology of the functional mitral regurgitation we show you here is a Carpentier 3B situation. He has a distinct medical history, which uh, concludes with a surgical aortic valve replacement. So he has a Hancock 2 bioprothesis and also coronary interventions. You see um, the uh, left ventricular ejection fraction is mildly reduced uh, to normal. You see we have a broad A2P2 situation with a tethering uh, of the leaflets, especially of the posterior leaflets, which is very important also for the strategy. Here you can see that we have a four centimeter valve uh, orifice. The extent of the regurgitation in the intercommissional view is across the whole A2P2 segment. So the strategy in the situation with a width of the uh, repair system of 10 millimeters was a one central to slightly medial Pascal system to eliminate, if possible, uh, the regurgitation. Now we're going into the interprocedural images. You can nicely see that we still have a very uh, severe regurgitation that intends, uh, goes into the indentation, so the segments uh, to the segment one and uh, three. Uh, you get a nice impression here also in the three-dimensional image with a pseudo prolapse. Uh, this is a so-called true view analysis of the leaflet motion. We now start this procedure typically as with all other transeptal uh, devices with uh, transeptal punctures. It is important to know that we have an adequate travel path, so we try to achieve a puncture height to the AV valve of more than four centimeters. Anything between four and 5.5 centimeters is actually ideal to do this procedure. The system in itself, as you see, we're slightly posterior here. On the left-hand side, you see a short axis. It's a very fast 30-second transeptal procedure. We exchange for a stiff wire, and now the 22 French sheaf, steerable sheaf, uh, goes into the patient. You can nicely see in the three-dimensional image in the middle how the dilator crosses now the septum. We see the wire that's in the left upper pulmonary vein. You can also nicely appreciate in the uh, fusion system on the right-hand side, which is an echo navigator, echo to fluoro fusion system. So you can appreciate the right atrium and the left atrium as well as the left atrial appendage and the small yellow, tri uh, the small white triangle gives you the rim between the LAA and the left upper pulmonary vein. Now the sheath is already in. We simply retract the dilator about one to two centimeters. Uh, we test the freedom of movement that we don't touch a wall. And now we simply retract, as you see here, um, the dilator. We take an immediate pressure and you nicely see that we have a V-wave of 50 to uh, 52 millimeters mercury and a mean LA pressure of 25 to 28 millimeters of mercury. Here you see the device. This is the Pascal system. It's a um, system introduces a system that uh, is similar to the Sapien uh, 3 aortic system that you see here. It is now being introduced uh, into the steerable uh, sheaf. Uh, it goes very smooth, as you can see here. Um, here you see in the lower left image, you nicely see the sheaf. Uh, and you can now see the Pascal system, which is in an elongated mode uh, that we now will slowly go into the left atrial appendage. We have a so-called inverted retraction, as you see here, of the sheaf. So I hold the Pascal in place and I simply pull back the sheaf. So we don't touch any wall. I go to the wall with the sheaf and then I simply hold the device and I pull back 
the sheaf and there's a small uh, uh, radio pack marker that you see here and if this radio pack marker is at the end of the sheaf you have um, put out the whole Pascal system completely including the spacer. We now foreshorten the whole system as you see with the black knob. The black knob is turned clockwise and we're now actually in a grasping or clasping ready position. We further close the system fully and then we go to the clasps. Those are um, the structures that you see transparent at the end, they are being elevated. What we do now is a simple steering um, of the steerable um, catheter, which is the middle catheter, which is simply turned clockwise. And this automatically brings you down uh, to the mitral valve. The system is unkeyed. This means you can turn uh, any of the three catheters against the other. So you have a very high degree of flexibility to any anatomic situation. Uh, the basic idea behind this is that the steerable sheath gives you the elevation to the valve so we can elevate the whole system to go away from the valve or to lower the system. The second system that you see here with a 90 degree curve actually is the steerable um, catheter system and this gives you access to the valve and inside the last catheter is the implant catheter which only goes straight out to the apex of um, the left ventricle. Now you see some movements. I go posterior, I move anterior. These movements are simple clockwise posterior, anti-clockwise anterior movements. Very easy to do. You see the three-dimensional image on the right-hand side and we now open the, uh, the uh, repair system in order to align the anterior and the posterior paddle. And what we'll show you now is after we have opened the system that we can independently control the two clasp systems. And we will see this both on fluoroscopy, but also three-dimensional echocardiography. So here you see that with a simple turn anticlockwise on the black knob at the end of the system of the implant catheter, we have opened the system nicely. We go into an LAO caudal projection in order to nicely show you from a side view here in fluoroscopy the clasp that are down and now we control both clasps. Here's a small pin that attaches the anterior and the posterior clasp together. I typically take this out and you can now see that we independently control these clasps. I put down the interior clasp which is below. It's a cardiology view so the aorta is at six o'clock and you will more nicely see this now uh, on the posterior clasp. So the interior clasp is to the black knob and now to the flush port is the posterior side. Look on the three-dimensional echo and you simply see with the suture uh, this night and old clasp going down and this is the fixation method that we will later use uh, on the mitral valve. So we have independent control um, of both clasping mechanisms and you see it is very easy to slide that up and down, um, a lot of control. If we have done this, we align the clip system into an anterior-posterior uh, position. And I typically like to control my, ready, my uh, rotation of the Pascal system actually in fluoroscopy. So what I do is I will align the system to an anterior-posterior position and I will range actually the fluoroscopy C-arm in order to get to a defined position here and to control than my clasping efforts. You see this turn uh, in the fluoroscopy on the left lower. We simply enter in an open um, clasping ready mode into um, the mitral valve. You can see this is a mitral valve that has a valve orifice area of exactly four centimeter, which is considered for regular cases as the lower limit uh, for treatment for this device, but there have been isolated cases that go uh, slightly below, also four centimeters uh, square. You now see that I align perfectly in the left image. This is a biplane image. On the left-hand side, we see intercommissurally both papillary muscle heads, and I try to be exactly in between those two papillary muscle heads. On the other side, we have a biplane image of the AP dimension, which is the anterior posterior dimension. And what I do now is that I slowly elevate um, these uh, Pascal uh, system, repair system into the valve. 
making sure that the leaflets are straight um, and straight orientated are not rolling uh, against the lower petals. This is very important for the sealing mechanism because as we discussed earlier and in the talk by Costas Bajas, that we have to seal leaflet to spacer and spacer to leaflet. And this is very, very important for the efficacy uh, of the system. Um, so you see, this is something we do uh, very slowly. We can also adapt the angulation of the device versus the AP situation. You see, we come a little bit from interior. To correct this, I have the possibility to put the sheaf system a little bit more posterior, which gives me a steeper aperture towards the valve. Um, this is the first uh, situation, closing situation. So uh, Felix Schreidel from our institution just put down the clasp to see nicely the tissue bridge already. So we have gained access and it's a very fast situation. As you've seen, this just took three seconds uh, in order to gain access between the interior and the posterior leaflet. The beauty of the, about the system is if this is not, as you see here, optimal in the first place, you can reopen any of those two clasps and get more leaflet or a straightened leaflet on each of the sides uh, into uh, the system. So this was a situation um, that we didn't like. Uh, the gradient, as you've seen, in a closed position was only two millimeters of mercury. Very important to remember if you see the ongoing situation, but of course there was still um, some regurgitant uh, jets, so this was not intended to be an optimal result uh, in this patient. So we reopened the situation. And as you see, I tried to be more um, strict with the posterior leaflet to go deeply until the posterior ring into the leaflet. And you see that there is some rolling. We also have a different height of the leaflet tip of the anterior and posterior leaflet. And you see that the posterior leaflet is relatively frail. It's very short. So this was one of the situations that was um, challenging in this case. You see the closing now. We did this uh, again under a, a second, uh, second try here. And you can nicely see later when we add color Doppler that this already got slightly better, but still we can do better in just changing now the position of this uh, system versus the posterior, uh, posterior wall. And this is what is being done now. We simply isolate it, now elevate here the posterior clasp. So you have seen the interior leaflet is nicely catched. We saw that we had more regurgitant uh, volume on the posterior side where the leaflet was very, very small, was very fragile, and uh, we elevate the clasps here and we simply go into a new, a new grasping mode. You can nicely see this. The pedals can be opened and closed. And again, by reclosing, you see that we get a much better result, actually in the same space, but simply trying to have more leaflet actually attached to the spacer. And um, if you look on the location of the uh, repair system, you almost see no difference. But here you can see that in the CV Doppler, the regurgitant jet has gone. And we still have a very steep situation of the anti-grade flow, which shows us already that we have no stenosis whatsoever. The pressure half time here is very, very uh, steep. So uh, we know that again, we have a pressure gradient between two and three millimeters mercury. The jet gets um, uh, traced to mild. And now we cut the suture lines, which could raise the clasp. So this is the deployment situation. And now after releasing the security pin, we turn the blue knob counterclockwise and you see the whole procedure is done. And typically in, in Mainz, we do a high five after a successful case like this. Uh, so we were quite happy with the initial result. A very unique situation about the Pascal repair system, as you see here, again, the Doppler looks very nice. Look for the gradient. And this gradient, again, is two millimeters of mercury, even though the uh, device seems to be large. And also the LA pressure fell by six millimeters of mercury at the end of the procedure. And it's very interesting to see that this um, experience and this result 
gets even better over time. And this is what I want to share with you. So you have now seen the procedural situation. The sheave is being pulled back, and we do a simple set suture uh, over the 22 French uh, puncture site in this location. So I will give you some information about the follow-up and the results of discharge. So the follow-up for this recording in this patient is available as discharge in the 30 days. The patient improved clinically to a New York Heart Association class 1 to 2. The MR turned trace to none, and you will see this. TR went mild from mild to moderate, and we had an LV and RV volume reduction with very good function. The interesting thing is that before the replacement, we had proximal uh, proximal to um, persistent uh, atrial fibrillation, and at discharge we also saw this, but the patient converted stable into sinus rhythm between week one and one month, and I can show you this. This is the follow-up situation as discharge. This is three days after the procedure, and if you look at the transthoracic echo, at normal hemodynamic pressures, you see there is none mitral regurgitation in this case, and also we have a trace to mild uh, tricuspic regurgitation, which went down in this patient. The gradient is between, uh, is about two millimeters of mercury, and you can see uh, the separation and, of course, the different distances in the RR interval in atrial fibrillation. Now, the patient just uh, uh, two weeks ago came back for its one month evaluation and I want to share it with you and you can see that the patient returned to sinus rhythm and that the result both in a long axis view peristernal is zero and in two views intercommissural as well as in the long axis view also transapical is totally zero. He's doing extremely well. He's now at New York Heart Association class one with an ejection fraction of his left ventricle of around 50%, uh, and he's very, very happy about this procedure. I thank you very much for the insight and the attendance to this uh, live case that we did uh, approximately seven weeks ago. Thank you very much for your attention. Stefan, thank you very much for this really brilliant and educative case, um, and you really showed how how well, easy to use the system is, and, and also the advantages which that system might have over other systems. For example, the independent grasping. Can you tell us a little bit of your experience in all the other cases? How often do you need this feature in daily practice? Actually, we, use, we don't use it in all cases, but uh, in a tendency, we use it in 50 to 60% of all implants. We, uh, in the majority of cases, we don't need it to actually capture the leaflets, but to do secondary optimization. And as you've nicely seen, uh, the first attempt, you would have said, well, the device, it's okay, but it's, uh, it's, it's not brilliant. There still was a lot of jet. And this is because this patient had a very fragile posterior leaflet. What we, uh, what we recognize in our experience of approximately 25 cases is that it's very important to get a very flat leaflet to the spacer. And this seals very nicely, and you have to attempt to do this. So we take pressure of the weaker posterior leaflet, we keep the anterior leaflet on, and by purpose I move half a centimeter versus the posterior ring. I take any tension of the posterior leaflet, and then I try to grasp deeply the posterior leaflet, even if it's short into the Pascal uh, mitral repair system. And I think this is a very, very uh, good approach. And we had a high success rate with this, uh, with this approach. So you shouldn't be shy to reopen the system and to further optimize. Um, and as I said, 50 to 60% we use this feature on purpose. May I also ask you, um, all those nice features may also have some well, potential downsides. Do you have any downsides recognized in your experience? Is there any, uh, well? We have treated, uh, you mean downsizing in the residual valve orifice or damage to the leaflet? Well, if, if, yeah, is there any Both. negative aspect which you would address with this? I think Becky already pointed out that the, the system actually has a fixation mechanism, which is the clasp. The clasp is about half a centimeter. The paddles itself are one centimeter wide. This distributes the force, actually, uh, in pulling together the leaflets 
uh, very wide across the leaflet, and there's a soft edge. It looks more like an egg than, uh, than like uh, a piece of, uh, of chocolate, for instance. So um, it is very soft at the edges, so this distributes the, the pulling force or the pressure on the leaflets very, very nicely. Um, you can easily reopen um, the petals any time. You will not lose the leaflets. Also, the number of frictional elements here uh, is excessively low. We don't have five frictional elements. We just simply have one row that keeps um, the, the, um, the leaflet inside uh, the clasp area, and this works nicely. You can also test the leaflet motion when you open the petals by a bouncing mechanism that I only showed shortly, uh, shortly in this presentation. This means you see the clasp rising and lowering, and you don't have to be afraid they are still in, uh, and you don't lose them. So the mechanic distribution distribution is already given even if the petals are open, so you have to readjust a little bit what you do. On the other issue about residual area, we treated one patient with a um, diameter of only uh, 32 millimeters with a valve opening of uh, uh, 3.5 centimeter, and also here we got a gradient below 4 with a single device, of course. It's also possible to place two devices, one against each other, and you can slightly even put the petals above each other. So you don't have a distance with two devices of necessarily 20 millimeters, but it's also put, uh, able to, you're also able to put them together to something like 15 millimeters or 16 millimeters, which resembles then two to uh, three devices with other systems. Let's go back to also to this independent clasping. Uh, let's ask our members from the, from the panel, do you have some, some experience with the independent clasping? Is there any danger associated with that? Well, I mean, I think uh, we've certainly mentioned uh, or mentioned that uh, this system is probably less tra traumatic than what we know, and therefore, um, uh, in this system, I think it's a it's a very valuable option we have, and um, uh, th indeed, this is something that uh, I also wanted to highlight, um, and which was nicely illustrated in this case. It's um, we have to recognize that in many cases, it's not the macroscopic movements we do with the catheter that, in the end, improve our result, but I mean, we hardly saw any movement of the catheter, but but just by minute movements of the of the uh, device, um, we got this excellent result in the end. And I mean, of course, um, given that um, this addition of uh, uh, separate uh, leaflet capture is very valuable, I think. We, we've perfectly have seen that um, it is safe, feasible, but also necessary to implant okay. this device as optimal as possible. But if you do so, it's really worth doing it because you can end up with a fantastic result such as this one. And um, as, as Stefan said, initial grasping can in most cases be done simultaneously and then optimization is done separately um, with optimizing only one leaflet opening or bringing up only one clasp and leaving the other clasp where you already had a very good grasping, leave it down. Uh, Stefan, maybe one more question. You showed very nice hemodynamic uh, tracings uh, before and after the uh, procedure. Can you tell us a little bit how you derived them uh, through the device? Yeah, the device is uh, set up that you can have live recordings actually um, of your of your pressure measurements. And as we published before and did this with several centers in Germany, including including Munich, we showed nicely that a um, lowering of the LA pressure by somewhere about uh, six to eight millimeters is a very good uh, marker actually for a success and also of course the reduction of V-Wave is, is something to look for. Uh, but here you could see that the results further improve. So, so the discharge was not the end, it was a mild regurgitation at uh, the end of the procedure, but a discharge already as well as 30 days we had zero MR. So, so this is very, very interesting that Perhaps the connection between leaflet to spacer, actually by filling the spacer with blood and perhaps some sort of uh, thrombosis inside, inside the spacer further adds to efficacy uh, in this system over time in the first uh, 24, 48 hours, which is very, very consistent, very stable over time as far as we know it so far with a limited experience, of course.
I think another feature you very nicely uh, showed was actually that the result was even better after the release of yes. uh, the device. And then during follow-up, uh, you didn't see any uh, residual MR anymore. Uh, to be honest, I, I also see this repetitively that actually after the release, it looks better. And I'm wondering, what, how do you explain uh, that? Uh, mechanism. Well, that's easy, especially if the if the uh, residual movement of the heart is there. So we have respiratory movement under general anesthesia. We also have the contraction of the heart versus a fixed catheter. So this is a very arbitrary situation where we fix the atrial side of the device and we have a moving heart underneath. So both the the smiled angulation you've seen it was very perpendicular, very straight, but even the small movements of uh, two to five degrees. Uh, still improve because the system can settle itself into the least pressure situation after you release, which it cannot do if it's attached to a system to the groin. So I think this this is a very good uh, uh, sign and you have to make sure, of course, that the system before is also quite relaxed, uh, but it shows that if it can go with the contraction, it's even more beneficial. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. I think we have to move on, and it's now a pleasure to introduce uh, Becky Hahn. She will now tell us a little bit more about the tips and tricks during imaging for this procedure. Becky. Thank you so much. Um, I, I do think that Stefan's case already showed uh, many of the tips and tricks and, and what we do to image. Uh, but certainly one of our primary jobs is at baseline to characterize the valve morphology. Uh, we look at uh, the flail with uh, the uh, flail gaps as well as uh, the tethering angles if it's functional. Um, in this particular case that you'll see the moving images on the second column, uh, we have a large uh, flail of the entire P2 system, uh, the P2 scallop, uh, with multiple ruptured cordy. Um, and you can image it either uh, with uh, three-dimensional imaging in a surgical view, which is in the middle, or uh, this is uh, really showing the, uh, the coaptation gap. Uh, from a, a cardiology view, uh, either view it, it can be easily obtained now with the current machines which have uh, automated uh, uh, workflow uh, uh, buttons that allow you to put yourself in a surgical view almost uh, really automatically. In addition, you want to make sure that you have no contraindications or uh, uh, some of these difficult anatomies that may uh, force you to plan even more precisely, but uh, clefts, uh, as you can see in the top uh, two images, uh, typically will go all the way down to the uh, base of the annulus, the base of the leaflet, whereas deep folds may still have leaflet uh, attached underneath. Both of these will still give the implanter some difficulty since the uh, grasping region is uh, obviously a, a large space. In addition, we will uh, size the effective uh, orifice area, not the regurgitant orifice area, but actually the area of the valve itself in order to pre-procedurally plan uh, the number of devices that need to be implanted. We also will characterize the mitral regurgitant jet, and this will require not only a look at the jet location and direction of flow, but also the number of regurgitant orifices. And then we quantify, typically using three-dimensional color Doppler, vena contracta area, so that we have an effective way of comparing pre- and post-procedural uh, results. Uh, the hemodynamics can be measured uh, uh, by echo, looking at reversal of systolic flow. You'll see this is uh, the patient, uh, again, that I showed already. The left upper and right upper pulmonary ve venous inflows were both uh, reversed in late systole. This, again, is a degenerative disease. We also look at the total stroke volume, which we will compare uh, to the stroke volume at the end of the case. Uh, typically, we will see a few millimeters, at least, of increase in uh, forward flow. Uh, we'll look at the pulmonary artery systolic pressures, uh, both uh, peak and mean, um, and also assess those afterwards. When you have uh, the, the repair system, uh, there are a number of steps to follow, which Stefan already went over beautifully, but it's the transeptal puncture, advancing the delivery system, positioning and orienting the implant, then positioning again below the leaflets, clasping the leaflets, and then the post-delivery assessment. 
So this is the way that we do our transeptal puncture. We like to do it on three-dimensional imaging. The first image that you see is from a bicaval view, so it's easy to understand. You can see the mitral valve uh, in the distance. Both the tricuspid and the mitral are now on FOSS and looking at you. Uh, this is the anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet. This is the commissure. So now this gives you an easy way of identifying exactly where the commissural line is and allows the interventionalist to guide the transeptal puncture along that uh, that uh, commercial line. Uh, we will then, uh, on two-dimensional imaging, confirm in a number of different views. This happens to be a biplane image uh, with the short axis on uh, the, uh, the simultaneous orthogonal view. Um, but then again, the third image that we like to acquire uh, is for height. And this is a, a, a medial position um, uh, in the uh, interatrial septum. Uh, once we do uh, either on three-dimensional or two-dimensional image, and we never, almost never will uh, measure directly off of a three-dimensional image, but uh, multiplanar reconstruct it. Uh, then you measure the sept transeptal height. This happens to be 4.5 centimeters, which is ideal. Then once the uh, transeptal puncture is performed, the guide sheath is introduced. And as you saw with Stefan's images, uh, you can follow the implant going into uh, the guide sheath and into the left atrium. And the job of the imager then is to make sure uh, that uh, the implant does not, uh, does not strike or touch uh, any native structures and to keep it well within uh, the, uh, the, the space of the left, atri uh, left atrium. And you can do this it's either on two-dimensional imaging or three-dimensional imaging. We will routinely uh, position ourselves in a, in a surgical view because, again, it's, it's pretty easy. It's just a touch of a button uh, these days with the new, uh, the new um, uh, echo machines. And then uh, guide uh, the, uh, the positioning of the elongated implant uh, to be free of any cardiac structures. Once the elongated implant is well within, in a safe zone in the uh, left atrium, uh, the, the uh, device is then closed and put into a closed position. And you can see both on three-dimensional imaging as well as two-dimensional imaging uh, that the device is now being shortened. Once shortened, it is then uh, uh, positioned over the uh, intended uh, uh, grasping area. And uh, you can see again that both position and trajectory should be determined by imaging. Uh, the independent catheter controls allows for um, a really accurate and intuitive adjustment of position and trajectory. And then in the leaflet capture ready position, uh, which Stefan also showed you, so now um, the paddles are, are opened, uh, you can then in this, in this surgery view or, again, in the inverted uh, cardiology view, you can orient the implant to the region of, uh, of uh, grasping. Once you've uh, oriented it uh, coaxial to your uh, coaptation zone, you then check uh, and identify the anterior and posterior clasps uh, in anticipation of the possible need for independent uh, uh, clasping. And so you can see here both uh, on two-dimensional, and Stefan showed it on three-dimensional imaging, um, but you can see the anterior clasp independent and then the posterior clasp uh, going up and then obviously checking for um, the angle of, uh, of uh, a, tra a trajectory and implantation with, uh, with both uh, clasps. Once you are then below the leaflets, we reorient and make sure that uh, you are exactly where you want to be. This is a very precise uh, uh, device. You can put it anywhere along the entire coaptation zone in any orientation. And so in this uh, particular case, with a very, very wide, uh, multiple chordal rupture, um, a degenerative disease, we were, and, and an, an initial valve area that started at about eight centimeters squared, uh, we determined that we were likely to use uh, two devices, um, and so position this slightly medial to the midline. Um, in, that, in that setting, once below the leaflets, we will gain out with our uh, three-dimensional imaging in order to see the device uh, below the leaflets and not have to move uh, into any kind of transgastric views. Uh, 
This is uh, on retracting the implant until the leaflets are laying on top of the inner paddles. Uh, we then can, uh, in the capture ready uh, position, ensure uh, either by uh, biplane imaging or, or single plane imaging, which gives you a higher frame rate and line density, we are able to see the leaflets well uh, into the um, paddles and uh, uh, laying on top of the paddles before lowering uh, the clasps. Once the clasps have been dropped, what we like to see is the clasp bounce. Here you can see it very, very well, um, both on two-dimensional imaging, but also on fluoroscopy. And that bounce allows you to see where the tips of the leaflets are, but also that you have adequate capture uh, of those leaflets prior to closing the device. Once you've again, before closing, reconfirmed the position and orientation of the implant, we like to close the implant on color Doppler, which allows us again to see the effect either on a single plane here with color compare or on a biplane image, uh, the effect of closure uh, with your device in its current position on the residual mitral regurgitation. In that particular case, the closure was great. We had marked reduction, but once, uh, once uh, it was closed, we saw the, that there was excessive motion of this flail portion of uh, the posterior leaflet, and we decided to optimize uh, the posterior leaflet uh, clasp, and there, therefore raised the posterior clasp, torqued uh, the device posterior, and uh, then uh, lowered the clasp again, uh, uh, this time uh, grabbing a, a greater amount of the posterior leaflet length, um, and again, closure on closure saw marked reduction in the amount of regurgitation. Implant release is also watched during uh, two- or three-dimensional imaging uh, in order to make sure that the, uh, once, uh, once the implant is released, that it remains in its position, but also that the catheter does not strike any other uh, native structures on its way out. And if you've decided you're, you're finished with the procedure, we like to watch the guide uh, catheter coming out and to record the, the, uh, the iatrogenic uh, atrial septal defect that's in place. Typically, we found that the QPQS for, the, for uh, these devices are about 1.3, so not significant, and then also check for pericardial effusion. The post-delivery assessment is similar to the pre-delivery assessment. We're looking at peak and mean gradients. Uh, we are also looking at the orifice area. So we never just rely on the gradients, uh, particularly given uh, the uh, effect of flow and ejection fraction on the gradients. And so we are measuring on 3D multiplanar reconstruction the separate orifices uh, prior to final release, but also at the end of the case. Uh, we then also assess mitral regurgitation. Qualitatively, certainly, this is a three-dimensional image. We were not able, there's, there's trivial amount of, of regurgitation. We ended up with two uh, clasps, uh, two devices in this uh, instance, and so there was trivial amount of regurgitation. We normally like to planimeter on 3D color Doppler. In this case, we were not able to actually planimeter that orifice, it's so trivial. And then in addition, you saw the initial pulmonary venous marked reversal of flow now has become systolic dominant, and this would be correlated with a, a, a significant lowering of the left atrial V wave and mean gradient. We finally will look at uh, relative stroke volumes as well. Uh, this happened to be an increase in well over 10 cc's per beat, uh, which uh, again told us that we had an adequate uh, result. So the independent catheter movement in three planes allows for very easy uh, access to the transeptal puncture height. It's very simple and easy to advance the delivery system, very intuitive positioning and orientation of the implant, both above and below the leaflets. Uh, the independent clasping allows for uh, optimization of leaflet capture, and uh, obviously in Stefan's case, a significant reduction in the mitral regurgitation. The elongated position, which uh, we did not show you, but if uh, you need to reposition in the, eight, on the, in the atrial uh, position, then the elongated position also allows for a safe uh, retraction of the device into the left atrium. And then the pre and post uh, delivery assessment involves not only an assessment of the position, uh, but the mitral valve area and gradients, as well as the residual regression orifice area. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Becky. It was a very nice presentation. 
Um, let me start perhaps with one question. You, you're doing a lot of imaging with different devices. You have a lot of experience. Are there any particular challenges for the um, imager with this device? Um, no, I think this device is pretty easy to image. The mitral valve in general is easier to image since the transesophageal probe tends to be very close to the dome of the left atrium. Um, we have started to use more and more real-time 3D MPR, so it allows you to do that multiplanar reconstruction, but real-time, so that the, the device is moving, which means that even in the setting where you can't align the annulus orthogonal to your, your uh, imaging plane, you can then, in real time, just reposition your image. And the frame rates in these new machines are so high that even on three-dimensional imaging, you get frame rates of 17 to 25. Um, and you can really see the clasps come down and the leaflets in uh, between the paddles and the clasp. And it's, it's just a great thing. I really highly recommend uh, using that modality, particularly when you haven't been able to align your, uh, your, the angle of the uh, annulus with your incination beam. So, but the, the device size, does it impact the shadowing Is it in the mitral valve? Do you have any? Yeah, so, uh, it, you know, it looks it looks very, well, a couple of things. One, it looks very large uh, when, when you're imaging it on three-dimensional imaging. Um, and that's, pr a lot. some of that is just the blooming artifact of a, of a, of a device um, and what happens with the, with the echoes. Um, uh, and it's just magnified because it's in three dimensions. Um, but remember that most of the, the beauty of the device is that what you're imaging is the bulk of the device is below, it, it, it is far field, and what you're imaging is actually near field. And so consequently, there has not uh, been really any difficulty in uh, imaging uh, leaflet grasping and the, uh, and the clasps coming down and ensuring exactly where you are. It's been, it's been quite easy. Um, and again, easier, even easier with now these advances in three-dimensional imaging. We have a few questions uh, from the audience on React uh, PCR. Maybe we start with the last one. Uh, to, and one of our panel members can address this. Uh, what are the limitations or challenges of the systems uh, that you have experienced in terms of device manipulation? I think it's important because we have now iteratively seen uh, the repositioning and the optimization. Stefan, you want to address this? One of the situations is, of course, that you have an unkeyed system. So you have a very short learning adaption that you, uh, if you turn one of the catheters, you can turn with itself one of the others. So you have to counteract a little bit. Um, but I think Speaks this down. this allows you a high degree of freedom, actually, to reach any position that you would like to have. So you can get uh, steeper, you can get more aorta hugging, you can get uh, have more flexing, less flexing. The cathedrals are able to go up to 110 degrees. It's, it's, it's very easy, actually, to reach any position. Then um, I think a related question is in what type of cases should you implant a second device? And, and I think it's important because we had now the repetitive demonstration, you do optimization and you can end up with one device, but when do you transition uh, to a second device? Well, for us, it's, uh, you know, we'll do the 3D vena contracta area of the color Doppler jet that's remaining. And uh, the cutoff for, uh, between mild and moderate is 20 millimeters squared. And so we'll attend, if it's 20 millimeters squared that's residual in, an, in a region that we think we can put another clip, uh, another uh, clasping device, um, then we will go ahead and, uh, and, and we'll go ahead and introduce a second device. So that's what happened on that case. We were left with a 23 millimeter squared uh, regurgitant orifice just, just lateral to the initial um, implant and uh, put in a second device, ended up with, with nothing, with no, no regurgitation at all. I think perhaps the, there is a sort of learning curve. If we look into the class study and if we look into commercial experience, the number of clips uh, of, of, of the repair system goes further down actually uh, than what we've seen there. So we've seen the class study, it's 1.5 repair mm -hmm. systems. And I think in commercial use, uh, this number is now right. even lower. Yes. Um, as I've shown, there is a certain movement to even lesser degrees to regurgitation. So I think we have to get and learn more cases before we live go into two devices. Yeah. So I think the future will rather show something like 1.3 or 1.2 yeah. devices uh, in the patients, I would uh, assume. 
but at the same time but at the same time i would like to to add not to be too reluctant to implant a second device especially if you're not happy with the with the um, um result after the first implant and from our experience we've seen now three cases where we had a gradient of uh, three and a half millimeters of mercury and then implantation of a second device brought that gradient up to only four so it is really it's not that easy to predict the gradient after the second implant but it's much more often lower than you would think um, so my message here would be if you're not happy with the result then not not be too reluctant to implant a second device. Perhaps one related question is the learning curve. Uh, so one, somebody asked how many cases are necessary to get uh, confident uh, with the device? Uh. I think if you have an experience with the other leaflet technology, <laughs> clipping technology, then um, um, it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, and you can get the basics um, with an experience of a few cases. Um, um, and then you start to realize the differences after um, you move to this technology and um, you, I think you quickly realize that the insertion of the device is very easy because of the hydrophilic coating. Also, the release of the device, it's much easy, quick. Uh, also, reaching the various areas you want to go with the correct trajectory it's also easier you don't have to follow some rules some keys some knobs you just follow instinctively the movement into three dimensions uh, and then like it was said before by others i don't think you, you you should be afraid to use the optimization of the independent uh, raising of the class because you have to remember that the difference of this device is that the spikes on the clasps are horizontal, not vertical. So it's, it's safe that you, if, once the, the leaflet is inside, you want to get it with all the spikes of the clasp. So this means that um, um, the, the safety is there. But if the leaflet is not well into the arm, then you may have the results uh, that uh, Stefan had in, in his first grasping. So the leaflet was inside, but not deeply enough. So had you left it there, it would be OK. You couldn't have any DS, uh, SLA. But uh, with optimization, what you did was you inserted the leaflet further in, and you grasped it with the spike higher up. That's why you um, improved your results. And we, as with respect to the um, using a second device, I think you should follow the rules we're used to with this technology. Once you have a suboptimal result with one device, I don't think there is any difference in the decision process to go with a second device. Good. Um, we, we have many more questions, but we should have short answers. Uh, yeah. Somebody asked about the anticoagulation. I think that can be rapidly done. Uh, yeah, so we use the same scheme we use for, for the other technology, yeah. MitroClip. So um, just four weeks of dual uh, um, um, platelet therapy, and then uh, we continue with aspirin. Or if there's um, oral anticoagulation, we continue that and go yeah. for four weeks uh, additional clopidogrel. Uh, one quick uh, question to Becky. Ice, uh, when do you use ice instead of TE? Uh, never on the mitral Good. side, but I guess so it could be. So that question um, is answered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, tricuspid we yes. do yeah. at the end, yeah. uh, on the way back. Yeah. Um, is uh, cardiac surgery backup necessary, uh, or even centers without a cardiac surgery can perform the procedure? Uh, um, we do have uh, surgeons on the floor, but not in the room. So there, there's no formal, um, you know, arrangement. Um, but there is surgery in the hospital, and we never had to use it, is fortunately. There <laughs> do, they, do we need to have them in the hospital? Oh, it's difficult well, to say, but uh, that's, there are that's conflicting more philosophy uh, yeah. <laughs> now, um, in the country. <laughs> I, I think one important <laughs> practical question is: uh, there a big need for attention on air embolism? Uh, I think that's uh, an of important course question. The, the, uh, the sheave that you've seen carries approximately yeah. 50 cc yeah. of fluid. So as with all uh, interventions on the left atrial or left-sided space, you should, you should flush and do an aspiration before. So you should really flush the system and make sure that you have no air inside. That's, of course, very important to avoid uh, a stroke uh, in this uh, regard.
Okay, Stefan, thank you very much. Now we have to move on. Volk, it's my pleasure now to ask you a very important question. How does Pascal, the, how does the Pascal repair system impact your daily practice? Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and um, for the opportunity to speak about uh, how the Pascal repair system can impact our daily uh, practice. Um, I think throughout the session you have um, been presented an excellent overview of the features of the Pascal repair system and um, I think we have um, gotten, uh, gotten a lot of insight into um, imaging uh, for these uh, procedures. So during my talk I just wanted to present you two cases which I think provide complementary information for you um, and uh, show that uh, this device really provides uh, features uh, that uh, will add a lot to our toolbox for uh, mitral valve repair. So this is uh, my first case. It's a 60-year-old male patient, slightly overweight uh, or considerably overweight, I would say. Um, he has an intermediate um, a perioperative risk um, based on a risk cause. Um, he suffers from dilatative cardiomyopathy, which was first diagnosed in 2012. Uh, he, he was implanted a CRT device in 2018, and I think he was on uh, quite... Um, uh, uh, well-developed um, medical therapy. Um, his left ventricle was um, really um, dilated with an um, end diastolic diameter of 80 millimeters. His left ventricular function or ejection fraction range was between 15 and uh, 20 percent. And um, from this resulted um, a typical um, functional uh, mitral regurgitation, which is shown here uh, with a biplane vena contractor of uh, 13 millimeters and an effective uh, regurgitation orifice area of 0.29 square centimeters. Um, this is the 3D surgical view of this patient, and I think as you already um, can notice, um, the 3D orifice area of this patient was not very large, and indeed it was measured with only three square centimeters. So um, this is, of course, as we have heard previously, uh, uh, somehow critical, but um, based on the experience we had before, um, we, um, we, we felt that um, Given the morphology of the of the regurgitant chat, uh, we would be able to get a um, uh, nice result with just placing one um, device. So that is what we did, and uh, we aimed for a central position, obviously. And um, here you can see uh, that after several attempts, uh, after several tries, this was the best we could get. So we tried to optimize this um, in several ways, but um, there was uh, a lot of uh, mitral regurgitation left. And so, of course, we started to discuss, well, could we maybe put in a second device and leave this device in place? However, um, the mean gradient that we measured was already 4.28 millimeters of mercury and um, the residual orifice area was um, not very large and uh, was measured with uh, 1.6 uh, square centimeters. Um, Nevertheless, we thought we cannot leave this result like this, and uh, our hope was, and this was reported previously, that with uh, the spacer that this device uh, provides, we would particularly with the second device not get much further a reduction um, of uh, the orifice area. And so what we did is uh, we placed a second device directly uh, lateral to the first device, and um, in these this resulted in a very nice reduction now and a very good result uh, with regard to mitral regurgitation. But, um, of course, what is much more important is what happened with the orifice area. And remarkably, um, it more or less remained unchanged, which might be an issue with our measuring. Uh, here we measured in uh, two planes. The other measurement was done in one plane. But nevertheless, I think this is a reliable measurement with 1.8 um, square centimeters. And so uh, we um, left this in place. And um, the, the gradient, importantly, also did not uh, change. It remained with 
with a 4.46 um, millimeters um, of mercury. And what is even more important, this is uh, the gradient on the discharge echo, where the gradient was still 4.5 millimeters of uh, mercury. And um, as we already have heard, um, there was uh, no uh, mitral regurgitation noted uh, on the discharge echo of this patient. So um, I think all in all, a very you could argue that we were lucky, of course, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a nice result and it, it illustrates um, what uh, the spacer can do here. So our second case um, is a patient with degenerative mitral regurgitation, 70-year-old male patient, again slightly overweight, um, intermediate perioperative risk, and he underwent bypass surgery in 2006 with, with at present all bypass grafts um, patent. He had preserved left ventricular ejection fraction and permanent atrial fibrillation, and below you can see his um, uh, medication. He presented with... Um, dyspnea on just mild exertion and was found to have a flail of the posterior leaflet extending from the medial part of the P2 segment to, towards the anterolateral lateral direction and resulting in a, a severe mitral regurgitation, which was eccentric, of course, uh, with an effective regurgitation orifice area of 0.42 square centimeters. So... Um, here you can see a biplane view and uh, where I want to draw your attention to the width of uh, this uh, flail, which was, uh, I think, uh, rather large with uh, 1.25 uh, centimeters, so that this would be a situation where you might want to consider to use two devices um, at first, or you, at least you would have to prepare to do this. Um, here is this morpholo morphology reflected on a 3D surgical view, and um, here the um, orifice area on 3D was rather large with uh, 5.7 square centimeters. So our strategy was um, to aim for just the central part of the uh, flail um, segment. And here you can see the image directly after our first uh, grasping attempt. And um, what you can notice is uh, that you see a nice bouncing of the posterior leaflet as a sign of proper leaflet uh, um, grasping, whereas there's no bouncing of the anterior leaflet. And indeed, we were also not very happy with the reduction of mitral regurgitation. I mean, um, the eccentric jet was uh, eliminated, but there was still considerable um, regurgitation left. So with the option of um, uh, independent um, uh, pedal control or, or um, clasp control, we um, just optimize the anterior leaflet as you have seen before. And this is, of course, um, very practical in such morphologies where you you're kind of happy that you got all the, the flail segment um, into the posterior clip and there's no necessity to, to give up that grasp on this side. So we could just optimize the anterior um, uh, leaflet and um, after that we got now bouncing of uh, both uh, glasps as you can see here and this also resulted in a much better reduction of uh, mitral regurgitation which remained unchanged also after a removal of the catheter. So in this case, of course, we did not expect to run into issues with uh, residual orifice area, but for the sake of completeness, the 3D microwave um, orifice area was uh, 3.4 square centimeters with a gradient of 2.8 uh, millimeters of mercury. So to conclude, I think the Pascal repair systems, uh, system provides us with some very important features which, which add important options um, for percutaneous um, mitral valve repair. One of these um, things is uh, independent and spontaneous leaflet capture, which is particularly useful in cases with uh, complex morphologies and something we, we have not discussed so far, I think is also very important, is that it facilitates imaging in difficult cases because you can't just focus on one, um, on one uh, leaflet. Um, the other um, feature we saw were the broad pedals. I think um, you could argue that if you needed two devices on this flail of the second case, there's always a risk that you have protruding um, tissue between the two devices. So it's very nice that you can cover all this um, flail with uh, just one device. And um, as you have seen, the central spacer um, 
fills the regurgitation orifice area without overt reduction orifice area, particularly for this, um, if you use it uh, for the uh, second implant, is our impression at least. So uh, I think it's, it's safe to say that um, uh, the um, Pascal mitral repair system is a safe and effective treatment option for all morphologies of mitral regurgitation, which is uh, nice, I think, and it's a nice addition just for our toolbox of percutaneous mitral valve repair. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Well, we do have some questions, maybe from the audience. We start with that. Um, what do you consider as a reference value for three D color Doppler regurgitant area? So this is, this is something you want to. So sorry. Uh, what uh, what a do you reference? consider as reference values for three D color Doppler regurgitant area? Contractor area. Um, well, it's the same as uh, the guidelines, uh, and these are true for both American and European guidelines. Are using 40 millimeter squared as as severe, and then 20 millimeters uh, squared is the partition coefficient between mild and moderate. And so that's where we're making our decisions. Uh, if we have left uh, 20. Uh, or more, then we will go for the second clip. I hope that answered the question. Okay, let's perhaps work for you. The last one, does free 3D maneuvering allow for fine movements or that is dependent on the physician's control in free space? So, I mean, um, I like, I mean, this is, I think, a personal choice. But for me, fine tuning, I like to, to have it on 2D, um, but that's very personal. I mean, we do a lot on 2D and just check the big scheme on, on 3D. And but I asked you in the beginning of your talk, um, what is your, well, how does it change your daily practice? And this is also the question here from the audience. Do you think, uh, do you consider this device an alternative to non clipping devices? Well, it looks like, right? <laughs> so it's, um, I mean, it definitely, the, the thing is that um, it, it just expands our options that we have. And, and, and this is, I think, very valuable. And it, I think what is even more important, it brings movement in the field. So. Maybe some questions also now for, for the panel. Last question. Did you consider to implant an LVAT for this patient with severely reduced LV function? Usually, the MR disappears after implantation. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree, and we, we do this quite a lot at our center. But I mean, the issue with LVATs, of course, is that this is a huge impact on, on quality of life for the patients, and a lot of patients don't just don't want it because you have the drive line, can't take a shower anymore. So I mean, this is, uh, and with a so a lot of patients decline LVAT in our experience. And remember, the COAP trial um, actually showed a reduction in yeah. the use of LVADs um, in uh, the functional patients. So I think, uh, I mean, that speaks for itself a little bit. I mean, you may actually be able to avoid the implantation of a, of a, of a large device. And the rate of infection, stroke, et cetera, under LVAD is not neglectable. So I think uh, we have to see where we have the turning point or the rim between both technologies on the long term. But uh, it's not a purely benign five-year follow-up situation also on LVAD. Yeah. No, but what it nicely showed is yeah. an excellent uh, procedural outcome with no yes. residual NR. And I think we, we, we remain with uncertainty whether there is a prognostic impact. Uh, but if the patient benefits from a symptom point of view, I yeah. think you already have done something good. So I think we are coming to uh, the end uh, of uh, the session. And uh, Jörg would uh, give us a short uh, summary and take home message. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. Um, yes, thank you very much, Stefan. So I think we had a very nice and a very educative session on this new kit on the block, the Pascal system. And we really have seen that, there, that this system has some new features which we did not have in the past with this optimi optimization for the leaflets. That we can uh, that we can very effectively uh, reduce the MR, something we could do also with other systems, of course, and we also have seen that you can do these in these also complicated patients with primary and secondary MR with a very excellent safety profile, and that was shown also in the in the first talk. Um, in the class study with really a very, very low complication rate, which I think is really the major beauty of this kind of therapies. 
Then we have seen um, in terms of imaging that that we need to have these nice images that we can use Im the imaging also to assess where's the anterior and the posterior class and how they independently work. Um, and then we, of course, use imaging to get to these great results. And we have seen great results uh, in, in the Life in the Box case here from Stefan. And we have also seen that we only, not only can treat uh, secondary MR, but that we can also treat very efficaciously degenerative or primary MR with these devices as shown very nicely and elegantly by Volker Rudolph in this patient with this large P2 flame with just one device. So I think, in, in, ladies and gentlemen, um, in summary, uh, this is really a, really a nice system, a new system, which is effectively um, reducing MR. Um, it has some features which we ha did not have before with the um, independent leaflet grasping and also this feature of optimization of one leaflet capture, which then um, allows us to even further reduce the MR if we're not happy with the first attempt. And uh, I, I'm sure that the future will show that this system is also as safe as all the other devices which we're currently using in the mitral space. Thank you very much for your attention.